In today's world of environmental and economic challenges, opportunity can be found in the most unlikely of places. In this episode, we're going to look at the business world and see how going green is a way to stay ahead. We'll also be looking at some of the controversy surrounding Ireland's peatlands and see if there's a solution that can keep local economies going and protect the future of this valuable habitat. A major conflict of interest exists between turf cutters and conservationists. One side wants to continue turf cutting as part of a rural tradition that's been going on for hundreds of years. The other side wants to completely stop cutting in protected areas and re-wet and restore what's left of Ireland's peatlands. Today we'll explore the grievances and look at how to find a solution for both sides. Turf cutting has occurred in Ireland since the 16th century and we're now down to one sixth of the amount of raised bogs left in Ireland and has resulted in a massive loss of biodiversity and wildlife. A significant downside in the use of peat is the level of associated CO2 emissions. A shocking one sixth of Ireland's total greenhouse gas emissions are caused by the draining of bogs and by peat extraction. To put this in context, the emissions from drained bogs, extraction, and burning of peat in power plants and homes emits more CO2 in one year than all the cars on our roads. When a bog has been drained and is no longer active, it emits large amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Originally, 300,000 hectares in Ireland was covered in small self-contained raised bogs that actively formed peat. Today, these active raised bogs have been reduced to 0.6% of the original area. The Irish Peatlands Conservation Council here in Lollymore in Kildare is actively involved in attempts to restore our bogs. The Bog of Allen was a vast area of peatland that stretched from the west coast of Dublin, if you like, right over as far as County Galway and into Galway City. This bog has been extensively exploited for nearly 200 years. So what we have here is just a little remnant of the Bog of Allen, and it's what we would call a local biodiversity area, just something special for the locality where the typical plants of peatlands can survive. Basically what we have here is we're on the edge of a little island, if you like, um, a circle of land. And our particular bog, this bit of the Bog of Allen, is just a triangle that comes down, pinched into a waist, and expands out again. And alongside this piece of it here is a massive industrial peatland area. And the, the impression that that peatland exploitation has caused on our bog is that it's actually tilted four metres down towards the industrial cutting. So we have a big problem here in trying to restore this area. We're just trying to do the best we can. It's not an easy project. It's just got too much long distance damage on the perimeters of it. The Irish Peatlands Conservation Council has an innovative restoration project which involves the transplantation of sphagnum moss onto damaged peat surfaces that has been re-wetted. The three-year-old trial here in the Bog of Allen has turned into a great success. But what about domestic turf cutting communities? There's been a lot of protests around the country about the banning of turf cutting on SACs. I cut turf myself as a child and have fond memories of being on the bog. Taking away an individual's livelihood or banning traditions is not going to solve our problem. We need to break down the barriers between environmentalists and turf cutters and come together to restore our bogs. Here in Clarabog, the ban has been in place for three years, but it was difficult for the community to accept. Turf cutting, which has been going on here for 500 years, is steeped in tradition and culture. Seamus Boland was a turf cutter who regularly protested about the ban on turf cutting. We couldn't believe we were being asked to leave this bog. I think we were first to say that we would do jail quite happily for this. And we over my dead bodies, stuff. Absolutely over our dead bodies, and we were all prepared for, for long stints in Mountjoy and all the rest. 
But that reflected the anger and also it reflected the complete lack of talking and discussion and dialogue between us and those who imposed this ban. Because you must remember, if you have a fuel system designed around turf and you have no longer any turf to go into it, then not alone are you, with, are you trying to find an alternative source of fuel, but you actually have to change the system in the house. I think you'll find in this community some people who would still not accept that. Would you know, by the way, that cutting turf would have been doing damage to the dog? In other words, yeah. that a, was that a, did that come to you as a, a shock? It did. We frankly wanted independent studies done by, by the government and department and Europe to prove whether that was the case. But the evidence from our perspective has really crystallised itself over the last few years. The bog has sunk. You recognise that that's so, not a healthy bog, yeah? I suppose reluctantly. Yeah. You know, we reluctantly. And again, you see, people do not like being told, as we were. All of the people on, let's call it the conservation side, kept telling us. And when we argued or tried to find a proper explanation, it was, well, you should know that. What sort of, you know, characters are you? If somebody comes around here in 20 years' time, and says to us, oh, by the way, the bog is still getting worse, even though you haven't been cutting on it, there will be massive anger, massive anger, because we will ask the question, well, why the hell were we taking off the bog if this isn't, isn't... So therefore, the next solution here is about restoration, Duncan. The, the almost indirect consequence of that is jobs for local people and making it a tourist attraction and all the rest. That's the win for the people locally. Like Clara, Gurley Bog in County Meath is also an SAC. Gurley is unique because the turf cutting issue was resolved here without animosity. The turf cutters are now actively involved in restoration work. Every race bog Duncan has big problems in Ireland because we've had 400 years of turf cutting. We've burnt it, we've planted trees on it, we've drained it, we've farmed it. We've done everything we can do with the bog in the line of torture. And now we're only getting a chance to really kind of try and conserve them. The Irish Peatlands Conservation Council's bog moss restoration project has been such a success that they've now rolled it out across the country. Catherine is here today to give a demonstration to locals. You can take off the top 10 centimetres of sphagnum from this donation plot, and that's enough to actually inoculate a metre square. So you come over here in this uh, little sample square. Uh, do you want to give me a hand? Yeah. Yeah, just take half of it there. I'll follow you, just tell and me what to do. And what you do is just break it up a little bit. Break it up. it around, it's quite a pleasant uh, task. Do you know, that's probably nearly enough. Just push it down a and little bit. And that's over a square metre. And is that all you do? No, there's just one more important step. So this is one that we have inoculated up earlier. And what happens here is you need to cover it with straw because at this point, these little fragments of moss, the peat there is actually going to draw any water they have out of them. So it's, it's kind of the wrong way around. Later on, when they grow on the bog, they actually draw the water up out of the peat. So you've got to keep them covered in straw for those just those first two years. So by just doing this simple process, Duncan, it is possible to have peatland restored to have the living moss on the bog restored within three years. Isn't that great news? It's very good news, yeah. So, tell me. Gurley and Clara Boggs both demonstrate that her peatlands can be restored and transformed into areas of recreation and ecotourism, while also providing badly needed jobs. So who wouldn't want this win-win situation? Recent understanding of the environmental impacts of turf cutting and the rising cost of imported fossil fuels has left big opportunities for indigenous sustainable heating fuels to come into the market. Today, 90%, 2 billion euro of our heating comes from imported fossil fuels with no benefit to our economy or to jobs. But how easy it could be to replace these imports by locally grown wood fuels and support the local economy. To find out more about how we could reduce our dependency on imported fossil fuels, I went to visit Mike Pearson, principal of Gertine College near Burr. Hi, Mike. Hi, Duncan. Pleasure Good to, meet to you. see you. Yeah. Tell us about Gertine College. Uh, Gertine started in 1947, Duncan, as an agricultural college to prevent young people leaving Ireland. 
expanded into all sorts of other areas of the land-based industries in the 80s, 90s, equine education came in. And how many students have you? There's about 250 students at the moment, Duncan, in the right. college. OK, and this is your wood chip here? Yeah. Very dry wood chip, Mike. Yeah, we get it from a local supplier. He brings it in a trailer, traction trailer load about once a, once a week. So what caused you to change to wood chip? Uh, look, our old boilers were reaching the end of their life. We had to look at a new system anyway. We wanted to put in an environmentally friendly system if we could, so wood chip was the obvious choice. But the savings with wood chip were huge compared to the other fuels. We estimated that by now we'd be spending 80,000 on peat or 100,000 on oil per year. And our first year's use of the boilers, we spent just less than 40,000 euro on wood chip. So we made a 50% saving on the peat and more than that if it had been oil. This has been a huge benefit to us in terms of the cost saving, but the educational resource it's put in there as well is great to show that students in the future can see the systems working. Besides Mike's saving of 60,000 euros per year on heating, the 40,000 spent on wood chip is now going straight back into the local economy and jobs. So Duncan, the buffer tank here is heated. That supplies the district heating system, which supplies the whole college with heat. We think we can halve our costs again on the heating, by what we've got across the road. Really? What's yeah. that? Let me take you and show you. This is our short rotation coppice willow plantation, Duncan. And this will be providing the fuel for those boilers that you've just been looking at over the next several years. Very good. And how many acres here? Um, there's 80 acres in total in the field, and we'll be harvesting 40 acres every year, and that 40 acres on a two-year growth cycle should supply the needs for the college. Right, so all of your own wood chip now is going to be supplied locally here? Yes. It's going to be supplied 500 metres from the boilers. What's that going to cost you? Uh, it's going to cost us in total between 15 and 20,000 to harvest and dry the wood chip. Right, so now you're down from 40,000 now down to 16,000. Yes. So massive. Massive savings. And when you compare that to the original 80,000. So 100,000. So we've gone from 100 or 80,000 down to 40,000 down to 20,000. Right, massive. We have 100 people living on site up at the college here. We have a willow plantation with loads of waste water, so we have a biofiltration opportunity here into the future. The waste products from the college will come here, they'll fertilise the willow, the willow will grow more, we might end up with more wood chip, and we solve a big environmental problem that might be there in the future. A real win-win, isn't it? I hope so. Look, come back in 10 years' time and see us, and hopefully we'll be in a better position still than we are today. Short rotation coppice willow is one well-proven cost-effective solution to heating on a commercial scale. But there are other great wood solutions for anyone with a spare acre of land that wants to grow their own fuel. I went to visit Deep Plant Horticulture near Enniscorthy. Here, Brendan Doyle is testing a very fast-growing eucalyptus plant that he plans to sell on for home heating. Do you take them in as seeds or what happens? Yeah, we grow them as seed. Um, this is the first stage here, they're grown from seed. This is about six months from sown. Then we transplant them into this, uh, to this stage here. That's, um, that's another six months. So they're about a year old when they get to this stage and they're ready for transplant out then at that stage. Duncan, this is a, a transplant that's ready to be planted out now. And this is a piece of eucalyptus that's just fresh cut and it's seven years old. So you can see the difference from this to this in seven years. It's incredible and you can see this one, two, three years four years, five years, six years, seven years. And look at the amount of growth in the seventh in last year. It's incredible. And this is ash, and this is, looks like ten years, ten rings in this, so ten yeah, year old. Yeah, ten year old ash. ash. And look at the difference between this and this. Yeah, there's about four times more timber in this than there is in that piece there. So how old are these ones here, Brendan? These are two and a half, gone on three years old. And is there much maintenance involved? We control in the first two seasons. You give them a balanced tree fertiliser when you're planting, and maybe again the following year. That's and roughly, that's it? Yeah, about 50 kilos per acre. So for the rest of the life of the tree, you don't need any more nutrient and no more weeding, nothing. You could almost shut the gate on them until year eight. Well, very easy to chop, great for firewood. Brendan explained that after eight years of initial growth, a half an acre plantation will deliver the equivalent of nearly 1,000 litres of oil every year in heating fuel. Currently, only 4% of Ireland's heating comes from renewable sources. To meet EU targets, we need to triple this to 12% by 2020. It's important that wood fuel is sourced from sustainably managed forests, that it's well dried and graded. And watch out for the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme, Mark. 
We all hope the economy is beginning to recover from the lows of the past few years. But if the country does start working again, how do we avoid repeating some of the serious mistakes we made in the past? In the boom years, Irish businesses became over-dependent on cheap imported fossil fuel and took little notice of the resulting emissions and their impact on our environment and natural resources. We also generated large amounts of waste and gave little thought to recycling. The money was flowing then, but now it's gone. These days, for a business to survive, it needs to be lean. And for smart companies, that means going green. There's a perception that green is expensive, a burden on the corporate bottom line. I want to find out what hard-headed Irish business owners think. Are they doing the sums, and is there money to be made and jobs created in a green economy? Fishing is one of our most traditional industries, but it's also totally dependent on our natural environment. I'm heading down to Wexford to see how our fishermen are coping in a challenging economy. Atlantis Seafoods in Wexford have 50 years experience working with local fishing communities, distributing their daily catch to shops and restaurants in 22 counties. Director John Kenny signed up for the EPA's Cleaner Greener Production Programme. I wanted to see how it worked out. So we started off with water, since we use a lot of water here. We used to spend about 14, 15,000 on water a year, and in the first year we saved 3,500. Wow. So, which was a great saving. Like. When we see the savings in water, we said, Geez, there's something big in, there's something good in this. And our next big thing is actually fuel for our vans. So with 15 vans on the road, we spend between nearly almost 200,000 a year on fuel. So that's our next big area, which we hope to tackle now in the, next, in the next year. John could do more to cut his transport costs and emissions, but there's a problem. And have you looked at biofuel as a solution for Bio to replace Yeah, we looked at biofuel very closely, but the problem with biofuel is the excise duty on the vat. The government really have to do something on that because that's too high. If they could have that even, and make companies like ourselves actually really look at it seriously. By taking on the challenges of running a greener business model, John can afford to be optimistic about the future of his company. Where we see the expansion is actually export into the UK market and further afield. And sustainability is a big thing in the UK market. We know our customers are going to look for that down the road. They're going to look for traceability on the fish, the carbon footprint on fish and things like that. So we said we might as well get in now and we can trace our fish right back to the boat. We buy most of our fish off Salty's fish in Kilmore Quay. And every box of fish is labelled, saying where the fish was caught, what area it was caught in, nearly what time it was caught. So we can supply that information to any restaurant. I think the more you get into the green thing, the more you see where you can save money. And it'll be the difference probably of business surviving and business not surviving, really. John sent me down the road to Kilmore Quay to meet Seamus O'Flaherty of Salty's Fish, his main supplier. How old is this cod? Four or five years old. That's the kind of fish we want to catch him. Uh, we won't let the smaller cod go through the net. What range of fish would you bring in from the, the seas? Well, we, we bring in, say, about 12, 15 different species. Monk fishes are probably the, the, the most common, yeah. So what's your biggest cost? Our biggest cost is fuel. Any trawler uh, uses a lot of fuel and uh, uh, comes to roughly uh, one third of what we catch uh, has to go on fuel. Roughly two million. Two million euros? Roughly two million euros, yeah, yeah. Seamus is doing whatever he can to reduce his reliance on imported fuel. As I found out, deep in the bowels of one of his trawlers. We're replacing inefficient engines with more efficient ones, and we're getting like 15, 20% more efficiency than, than we had before. That new engine costs Seamus over 100,000 euro to install. A hard decision to make these days, but it's a sound investment. He's also replaced his propellers, his old heavy-duty gear with lighter nets with a bigger mesh. That cuts down on drag, saving fuel, and makes the industry more sustainable. A fish that, that, that's in the net, right, that would have been killed, right, for, uh, because it's small, doesn't have a great commercial value, maybe comes back into the net in a year and a half time or two years time, but in that time they've uh, reproduced. And the net result is that we will end up with more fish in the sea. We see this as a sustainable issue. We want fishing to be sustainable, which will allow us and people to come after us to uh, make a living in the future. The fishing community in Wexford has learned the hard lessons of the post-boom years. The Environmental Protection Agency, through its Be Green programmes, 
helps companies like them to evaluate the benefits and the profit and loss of tackling their impact on the environment. So why should industry care about these issues? They can save money, they can improve their image, and you know, to me these are very logical things for a business. We can work with them to reduce their environmental footprint, at the same time reduce their operational overheads, so they become more competitive as a business while reducing their environmental footprint. To me that's, you know, it's a no-brainer, it's a win-win for everybody. We are offering free services and free advice on how to make them more resource efficient, looking at how they manage energy, looking at how they manage raw materials, and looking at how they manage their water and waste costs. And what type of businesses are involved in this area? There's a very large range of businesses, everything from hotels, restaurants, through to hospitals, uh, community centres, local authority facilities, and right through to large factories like this uh, Atlantis fish factory here, we're looking to kind of generate a momentum across society to be more aware on how they use resources. By 2050, it's predicted we'll need at least two planets to supply the resources we need. So that's not going to work. One of the ways Irish businesses can be competitive is by being lean, and we can help them do that. So you've just enjoyed your sustainable Irish fish and chips, but that's not the end of the story for green business. Both John and Seamus are struggling with the cost of fuel to run their businesses. There is a locally produced alternative. Green Biofuels Ireland in New Ross can work wonders with the leftovers from your local chipper. Their biofuel doesn't supplant food crops, our forestry in the developing world, and their production is not carbon intensive. Joe, tell us what you produce here. We produce biodiesel, Duncan. We, we produce 30,000 tonnes of biodiesel per year, uh, made from used cooking oil and tallow. And if you didn't use this and recycle these two products, what would happen to them? Well, particularly the used cooking oil, it can be a major problem in drains, in, in cooking establishments and even at home. They block up the drains and cause a lot of problems, particularly in towns where county councils end up spending a lot of money trying to clear drains. And where does it come from? Is it restaurants or where? Um, most of it comes from restaurants, hotels, catering establishments and even some from, from households. There, there are a lot of recycling stations around the country and we source some from there as well. So what does the final product look like? There's a sample. It's very clear, which is because of the distillation process. Much clearer than diesel, conventional diesel. Slight smell. Will you smell that when you're driving? No, when it's mixed at 6%, that, that smell disappears. Right. The business is driven by the Renewable Energy Directive, which mandates 10% biofuel in all road fuels by 2020. We're currently at 6%, and we have to get a roadmap from the government to go from 6 to 10% by 2020. Joe's biofuel production is a welcome step in cutting our dependence on fuel imports, but most of that mandated 6% of biofuel still comes from overseas and has question marks over it. There could be an opportunity here. So, Joe, what are the benefits of this now for Ireland? The first one would be reduction in fossil fuel imports, therefore money is staying in the country. Second one would be jobs, uh, 100 jobs, uh, in possibly increasing up to three, 400 with, with expansion and with the mandate increasing up to the 10%. So, regarding your own business here, are there opportunities to green it? There are. Currently we're using uh, gas oil to generate steam for, for the process. We're looking at other means of producing that energy in terms of waste and possibly looking at combined heat and power process to reduce our fossil fuel usage and possibly bring it down to zero over, over the coming years. My quick tour around the South East has shown me that Irish companies are beginning to look at green ways of doing business. And when they do, they see that the figures make sense. For profits, and for new jobs. There is a good message here. Irish businesses, despite the economic pressures, are taking their head up from the wheel and looking around and seeing, what's my future? They are taking on the challenge. They are getting it done. If we embrace resource efficiency and a greener approach to business, we will assist in delivering the economic and environmental resilience needed to sustain our society into the future.